Hey y'all, welcome back to the channel. I'm Texas Dad, this is my son Matt. We're going to do a quick reaction video today. This is a small excerpt clip that Johnny Bigger put together um, and it's a longer form interview between Jordan Peterson and Michael Yan. And for you, you that don't know who Jordan Peterson is, he's a clinical psychologist and he is a professor emeritus at the University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, he's a modern day philosopher. He does a lot of speaking on the good, the bad, and the ugly of society. And this, this interview between him and Michael Yan, Michael Yan is like a um, international, he was, he was in the military and then he's lived all around the planet. Okay. And uh, he's kind of like a consultant, and I think he does reporting on different conflicts around the world and different things like that. I think he was a green, he was like the youngest Green Beret or something oh, like really? that. Yep. Huh. It's a very pertinent interview, and I really like this small excerpt because mm -hmm. it really kind of concentrates a lot of what we've been talking about, and it does it very, very concisely, compactly, and succinctly, and I think we can expound on it a little bit from our viewpoint and how it's going to intersect and tie into many of the other videos we've done. So we will link uh, Johnny Bigger's excerpt video down below. We will also link Jordan Peterson's long form video down below. Uh, they're both, both excellent. Watch them in their uninterrupted states. And I'm going to hand it off to Matt. So before we get into today's video, just wanted to say real quick, we have merch and we have t-shirts, we have mugs, we have stickers, bumper stickers, magnet stickers, and lots more over at our website. We have, we are the CO2, we have the then diagram t-shirt and many more over there and go green compost, a globalist bestseller. That's at the Texas, www.thetexasboys.com. We'll put it on the screen for you. So check out our t-shirts yep. and our merch over there. And let's get started in the video. If you lose the farmers for one generation, you, learn, you lose all that knowledge. You know, and I, I saw the government said, well, some of these farmers are just gonna have to move. It's like, what are they gonna do? They're gonna move their farm. How are you gonna do that? You can't move a farm. Yeah, so you can't move a farm. He has a very good point about that. I mean, we personally know what it's like to start a farm from scratch. And I mean, it takes years. And we are on year seven. And every year we pro we get better and better and better. I'm just making we, sure. You know, we add infrastructure every year. Yes. And we add, uh, you know, we've, we have a very large uh, multiple orchards mm -hmm. and th that is literally impossible to relocate. Yeah, it's not like you can bebop around and be like, I'm homesteading over here, I'm homesteading over there, you know. Yeah, and when you're putting in infrastructure, yeah, permanent fencing, absolutely. permanent barns, you're not moving any of that stuff. No. Besides the fact that it's incredibly uh, capital intensive and you're investing in it because what's gonna make it profitable is exactly. because you're investing in it for the long term. Uh, we talk about, hey, when you put in a fence, the great thing about installing a fence is you do it one time and you're mm -hmm. done. So you systematically do the sections and you're done. Yeah, you're gonna have to come back and do some maintenance, but you Whatever. do it once and you're done. That's your infrastructure. And it is, imp I mean, only a politician, only a technocrat, <gasps> only some think machine, <sighs> Only uh, the Rand Corporation would yeah. say, oh, we're sorry, farmer. Uh, you're going to have to move your farm 30 miles east. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a technocrat for you. And it's not like these things are just, what, transferable, fungible in this simplistic manner. And so, yeah, this is, gen this is it's such a form of insanity and it's all justified by the fact that these half-wit globalists are claiming constantly to be moral because they're saving the planet. And you know, I know this literature. I know the, lit the planet saving literature, let's say, because I studied it for about four years and in some depth, and I think I found the world's thinkers who thought this through properly, and that would be Matt Ridley and Bjorn Lomberg and Marion Tupi, most particularly, and all three of them, and I would put Bjorn Lomberg at the top of that uh, list. Those thinkers knew something fundamental and something so bloody optimistic that I couldn't believe it was true when I first encountered it. 
The best way to do that, absolutely obviously, is to distribute autonomous free market systems as widely as possible, and then to get people everywhere in the world as rich as we can, as fast as we can. Autonomously free market mm. systems and free market principles. This is something that comes up time and time again on our channel. And this is something that we're only exposed to in this social media space because I can't even appreciate the, for whatever reason, well, I know why, because we live in a postmodern society and critical theory and critical race theory and the Frankfurt School and all these things that started in the 1800s and uh, Fabian socialism and, you know, Keynesian stuff and all, all these different um, scholastic models that started in the late 1800s that have gotten us to where we are today. So I understand exactly how we've gotten there, but us, our family as um, self-starters, I mean, I grew up poor on the wrong side of the tracks and all these different things, and we weren't handed anything. We worked mm -hmm. for everything. We were graciously blessed by God um, for everything that we have is a gift and a blessing from Absolutely. God. But, but we worked for it, you sure. know? It, we didn't quit. We started, we didn't quit till we finished. True. We got to the end and we, we strategically relocated eight years ago and we started from zero with nothing, with very little assets. We didn't know anybody. We didn't know anything. Yep. We didn't know anything about farming. We didn't know anything about planting. Yep. We didn't know anything about cows. We knew nothing about everything. I mean, that's what we knew. We knew nothing. Yep. And nobody helped us out. Nobody helped us get started. Nobody gave us any seed capital. Nope. We bootstrapped it with the grace, by the grace and the mercy of God, I cannot, um, not give God the glory for, yeah, for what we have now and where we are and how it has exponentially mm. grown in the past seven years and the amount of land has exponentially expanded and everything that we have. But it wasn't through any type of communistic no. or socialistic system. It was not achieved that way. We didn't steal it from anybody. Nope. We didn't take it from anybody. We didn't lie to anybody. We didn't lie, cheat, and steal. Nope. Um, nobody handed it to us. Okay. There wasn't a government program. Um, there wasn't, we didn't use any grants. All right. Nope. We used no social programs whatsoever. We paid our taxes every year, every penny, all the way through. Every year, every year, and every year. And I'm still waiting to get some big refunds or something. All right. The amount of feedback that we get through this social mm. media and this glorification of socialism mm. and this conflation of communism and community True. is hard for me to, well, it's very easy for me to understand yeah. because when you've been taught by the black mirror and you've grown up in government propaganda schools, whether it's America, whether it's the UK, whether it's Australia, whether it's New Zealand, whether it's the Netherlands, Internationally, you went to these government propaganda camps and you've been programmed. True. And the predominance of these programs are socialism, communism, fascism, socialism, communism. The three solutions are fascism, socialism, communism. You know why? Because capitalism is demonic and evil and that's how we got here. But the solution is socialism, communism, fascism. And it's just, it's the furthest thing from the mm. truth. And I can, I can completely understand people that have no understanding of capitalism and no opportunity in a capitalist opportunity. And they've been either on the government dole or they've had some type of government job in most of these countries, the predominance of work, and it, just like it's turning here in America, are government jobs. And with that government job comes the government training, the government propaganda, and the sensitivity training, mm -hmm. and the all these other things and trainings and pro reprogramming, deprogram you, reprogram you, and all these things. Jordan Peterson, he's a Canadian, okay? He's not an American. And these other um, economic philosophers and these scientists and these guys that look at it and they say, autonomous, free market, capitalism, free market, autonomous mm -hmm. systems are what's gonna lift people out of poverty. Now, the inverse that is detectable, perceivable, and understandable from history 
is what communism, fascism, and socialism has done to economies around the world and is doing. Mm. And people want to point to China as some kind of capitalist model. <laughs> and we all know that Heinz Kissinger and um, Zinyanev Brzezinski, I can never say his right name right, but Tragedy and Hope, you know, and China and the selection of China to be the next world power hmm. in the 60s and 70s. And now it is where they designed it to be, you know, build it up, put the factories there, ship our production over there, keep artificially reduce the price of products for a hyper consumerist. Look, we're, we don't apologize for America. We are a hyper consumerist, uh, yeah. We are built and driven on debt. We're a debt nation. Yeah. Everything is financed, and we're a hyper-consumerist uh, economy. And we, the reason that we've achieved what we have achieved is because we chose to observe the masses and do the opposite. So while everybody's like, refinance, refinance, debt, 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 bigger, 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 yeah. bigger, we yeah. said no. We said smaller. <laughs> we said pay as you go. We mm -hmm. said cash flow. We said debt free. And we're eight years into this whole new deal, completely debt free. We got some cash reserves. We got stuff. We got infrastructure. We got investments. We got food 401k. We have dirt coin. And every year we add to that and we grow, grow, grow in this autonomous capitalist model, which is yeah. quickly disappearing, which is why we're doing these videos. Exactly. So Same these 87,000 new IRS agents uh, that are fully armed mm -hmm. are coming to your house and under the threat of force, they're going to take, under the threat of force, they're going to take your voluntary federal income tax that is not a portion and is unconstitutional, but we pay our taxes, y'all. True. Just saying. Yep. But, and, and I'm completely unaware that the federal government needs 87,000 <sighs> more. And with all those extra IRS agents, guess what? The Bill Gates and the Jeff Bezos and all these, they, them, the Peter Thiels and the, who's the Tesla guy? Elon, Elon Mus the Musker Noodle, the Musker. Musker Doodle, Elon Musker Doodle. They ain't going to be paying any more taxes, y'all. True that. They are getting mm. federal grants, and they're going to get um, federal tax havens, right, mm. in their nonprofit, mm -hmm. non-governmental organizations. Yeah. Feed the poor. Yeah, to feed the poor. <laughs> Meanwhile, the technocrats are going to starve everybody. True. Yeah. Because the biggest contributor to environmental degradation isn't industrial... Uh, it is, isn't industrial development. It isn't the efficiency of the Dutch farmers. It's absolute bloody poverty and privation and the probability that people at the bottom of the economic distribution are gonna fall into these po catastrophic positive feedback loops that you described and devastate and lay waste to everything. As soon as you make people rich, the data on this are crystal clear. As soon as you get people up to about $5,000 a year in gross domestic product, they start caring about the environment locally and autonomously. And so, you know, we're in a situation right now where if our leaders... That's the thing, as farmers, which we are a very small farm, we're more like a homestead slash farm, but as farmers, each year, we try our hardest to become more and more efficient and sustainable. Um, and we actually covered this a little bit in a uh, warning from a Canadian farmer too, which every year they invest in more and more technology to become even more efficient with all their farming equipment and everything like that. Farmers, as farmers, we are not out to kill the world with our animals. Um, we are trying to grow our communities and actually make the world a better place and a more healthier place to be. And we don't, we are not building large factories to make these Wonder Burgers and these disgusting vegan plastic foods. We are actually trying to become even more, we're trying to um, have a very basic uh, way of life and try our hardest not to buy from these big mega corporations that dump thousands or tens of thousands of pounds of trash into the environment and into the oceans and into the atmosphere and spray every living day over top of our heads with chemicals and heavy metals.
That, that's why we chose the homestead is exactly. we wanted to grow our own food yeah. in an organic, sustainable way. One, to create bounty, yep. to be more bountiful, to create more that we could share or sell. And two, to generate our own food so that we know what's in it, what's mm -hmm. on it. When was it picked? How was yeah. it picked? Was it sprayed with anything? We don't have to rely and trust in the organic USDA label. Exactly, because we all know about the truth in advertising, mm -hmm. and there's just as much falsehood in that USDA, yeah. that USA USDA sticker as in anything else that uh, may or may not be on yeah, the Yeah, we can slap the organic USDA sticker on something and charge them five times the normal price of something. Right, and, and when that yeah. organically grown item is shipped to the middleman, that middleman can spray it with whatever yeah, he wants. Exactly. And it's still organic, mm -hmm. all right? And he's gonna spray it with True whatever that. kind of chemicals, and you have no idea, right? Yep. Well, it's organic, and you paid 40% more for it, yep. and it could be spray bombed with whatever. So that's why we chose to do this and to homestead yep. and to grow our own stuff was to be, uh, to have a smaller footprint one, and to have a smaller True. impact on the environment, not to impact the environment, no. but to work synergistically exactly. with the environment and with uh, God's creation to, this is just what Bill Mullison and mm -hmm. Jeff Lawton and Joel Salton, they talk about working the fringes and yeah. this interaction of man and God's creation to create abundance, and that's what we want to do. And this counter argument is, is obviously, if you're not for the, you know, you're either for, you're either against the environment exactly. or you're for the environment, mm -hmm. but you can't be against the environmental agenda, but mm -hmm. still want yes. to protect and exactly. improve and work with God's creation and yep. the environment and simultaneously make it better. That's the beauty of it. And that is possible. And I think that's what Jordan, that's one of the things that Jordan is vocalizing here that we've seen from the uh, Netherlands farmers, how they've worked directly in concert and these challenges Absolutely. were brought up and they addressed the challenges. Yep. They met them head on and they worked on solutions, not a, the technocrat solution is elimination. Yep. Oh, just get rid of the cows. Just move your farm. Just delete your farm. We'll delete your farm and delete you. You know, you've worked all this hard at it for all these years, yep. but now we have decided we are the decider. Yep. Just weren't so concerned with scoring cheap reputation points and being hyper moral in their ignorance and, and pretentious in their global uh, ambitions. We could be working towards a world where everybody had enough food and enough education and were simultaneously inspired on their own account to do what? Engage in the kind of environmental stewardship that would leave a good planet for their children and their grandchildren. We could have our cake and eat it too, you know? And yet what we're doing is we're breaking the supply chains and dooming the poor and, and fostering what's going to be a mass migration into Europe. And that's just gonna be a bloody catastrophe. And I, I hate to see this, and, and I, th I hope I'm wrong, and I'm just being paranoid, but, but I don't think so. I don't think you're being paranoid. That started in Canada, jumped over to the United States. It's over here now. I mean, it's really growing. This courage is, is spreading. And so, uh, and, and you see Italian farmers, Spanish farmers, people are rising up. And the more they realize what's actually happening, because, you know, the man behind the curtain is the, is the WEF, the World Economic Forum. Of course, we're gonna have to deal with China, but at this rate, look, if Germany falls from these energy issues, which is looking pretty likely at this point, China is gonna peel off the rock too, right? As are we, economically, right? We cannot sustain the collapse of Germany. That's absolutely 100% obvious. That would be an utter bloody catastrophe. If Germany collapses, the EU's gone, right? For a while, right? And, uh, and, and uh, I mean, the EU will probably dissolve. That's my guess, I don't know. We'll see when time unfolds. But obviously that'll take our economies with it and China, right, and Japan. And of course, Japan imports, what, 60, 70%? All these island nations and island state like Hawaii that imports. So you, you wanna talk about what the United States imports? Yeah, so uh, as he just said, Japan imports 60% of their food. And um, so here's some stats on the U.S. and importing their foods and stuff like that. To help meet these consumer demands, the United States imports about 15% of its overall food supply. 
today more than 200 countries and or territories and roughly 125 thousand food facilities plus farms supply approximately 32 percent of the fresh vegetables 55 percent of the fresh fruit and 94 percent of seafood that americans consume annually so uh, m many countries by design cannot feed themselves sure. and this has been by design over time over years we've traveled and we've been to different um caribbean countries mm -hmm. and uh, we've talked to the locals and they've explained this place is a tropical paradise. Yeah. We had everything and the government comes in and the World Health Organization and the these uh, NGOs, these uh, food or world food, food organizations and the food world order, the food world order comes in and they say, you got to dump out your raw milk. Yeah. Um, you got to dump this out. You got to dump that out. We're going to import it for a tenth of the price that you can profitably manufacture it for. So we're gonna kill the market, we're gonna import it in, we're gonna get you addicted to it, and so that way your growing infrastructure is gone, mm -hmm. right? In America, we're gonna say, we're gonna make these dumb corn mandates for ethanol gas, and we're gonna take all these crops and all this land used for growing food, and yeah. we're gonna turn it into growing fuel or growing these oils that are non-consumable right or for biodiesel or whatever sure. and it's just the systematic destruction it's the systematic destruction makes me think of we just had an anniversary about uh, systematic demolition or something it makes me think of a couple of days ago but um it's yeah. an inside job it's been done by design and it's a systematic destruction of our food supply and our food chain and the alarming thing is, is it's not just here. Mm. It's not just here. It's not just in the UK. It's not just in Australia. It's not just in the Netherlands. Mm. It's not just in New Zealand. It's not just in South Africa. It's not just in South America. It is everywhere by design and the food world order and they, them and those and all these technocrats and these social planners and social engineers have done this the long game since the late 1800s by design. And now here we are. And now all of a sudden we're going to have a we're going to have a climate crisis. We're going to have a food crisis. We're going to have an energy crisis, all simultaneously. Oh, and, and it just so happens that the world is in world war, all simultaneously at the same time. I mean, who would have thought? I mean, but we've seen this cycle, and the reason we see this cycle, and the reason that these key components um, overlap and interject like cogs in a in a machine mm -hmm. is because it's been designed that way. Yeah, and uh, the social planners and social engineers say, well, we know if we do this, this happens. And if we do that, that happens. So if we yeah. do this, that, and the other, you know, and here we are. Import Hawaii, 90% of their food is imported, right? All yeah, the, yeah. They are going to be in for a world of hurt. I don't know if there's a more intelligently and compassionately and justly civilized country in the world than the Netherlands. So let's think about that country. I mean, first of all, it shouldn't even exist. The Dutch had to literally drain the oceans and build walls just to make the country exist. And believe me, man, you bloody well better be organized in order to do that. And they did that hundreds of years ago and put together this unbelievable system of irrigation and drainage that ran on those amazing windmills, which are technological marvels. And, and Dutch society is unbelievably civil and peaceful and productive and interesting and culturally vibrant. It's a great country. It's a, it's a stellar miracle, as Ayan Hirsi Ali uh, pointed out when she moved there from, from uh, Somalia. And so, so we w don't want to underestimate the central significance of Holland. And then, obviously, of the Netherlands, obviously that country is predicated to some degree for its success on the provision of stable food supplies and these unbelievably efficient farmers. And so the fact that they are up in arms about all this is of signal, symbolic, and practical importance, which is why I think it's so necessary to focus on their concerns and also so appalling that this isn't headline news in every, every legacy media outlet across the, across the West. Farmers are not militarily trained, all right? Mm -hmm. Farmers get up at the crack of dawn, go to bed when it's dark, and work themselves to death to put food on the family, you know what I mean? And so 
That's what's amazing about this. And farmers all around the world are ringing the warning bells, right? Mm. And saying, no, yeah. and this shall not pass, okay? And we can't do this. And maybe they're spraying manure on their capital buildings. Great idea. Maybe okay. they're lighting hay bales in the middle of streets. <laughs> Whatever it takes, right? Yeah. Like, hey, we need we need to one look, we're not just growing food for us. No. We're growing food for everybody. Exactly. Like if, if we don't grow food, you don't eat. Mm -hmm. And that's what's fascinating about this entire process. And the answer, the resonating answer is you don't understand. You can't feed the world organically. We need all these fertilizers and pesticides and all this stuff, right? So the alternative to this big ag big think is nothing, is cricket burgers, is black soldier fly larvae uh, tacos. Like if you think about it, if everybody had a small garden, a couple of chickens, and I don't know, either some type of either goats, pigs, sheep, cows, something like that, we would be in a way better place. And we were, like when was that? When was what was the time? 1900. 1900s? When it started to kind of fade to out. To move from agrarian to industrial. Okay, that's what it's called. Yep. Okay. And the, the crazy thing is, is that the power structure and the crisis actors and the crisis, 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 you know, mm -hmm. the sky is falling people is like, no, you don't understand. This has to happen yesterday. Well, it took us a while to get into the predicament that we're in, yeah. right? It's going to take us a while to get out. And that's what, these, time. that's what these Netherlands farmers are saying. They're saying, yeah. look, if you want us to reduce these different numbers, we'll do it. We can't do it yesterday. One, if you're going to be reasonable, logical, and rational, you're going to have to put it on a time horizon and a time frame that is remotely achievable. Yeah. It's not right? next week. <laughs> right. And, and that's, but, but that's by design yep. to crash exactly. and crush yep. the system. Because when the Dutch farmers are upset, and moving on moss the way they are, something has gone seriously wrong. This is a canary in the coal mine situation. So you have Jordan Peterson, Canadian, right? And Michael Jan, he's a international expert. He's been all over the globe, lived all over the world. And they're recognizing this international global phenomenon by design. They're, they're, they're looking at this blueprint that's occurring by design and they are ringing the warning bells and saying, hey, wake up, something has to be done. Yeah. And you know, the, what we're trying to do on this channel is educate people. Yeah. One, we wanna educate them with our lifestyle and we yeah. say, look, we, we think, we believe, we feel, we know that our lifestyle is the solution. And our lifestyle isn't for everyone. No. And we meet subscribers all the time and they're like, you know what? We're old, we're retired, we don't have any dirt, yep. we can't do what you do, but we appreciate what you do. And we'll buy from you, and yep. what do you have available? And we wanna work together, yep. and we wanna do this. And that's that's the reality. Nobody, yep. nobody is saying that everybody has to do this one thing. No. Everybody has to eat paleo. Everybody has to eat keto. Everybody has to eat vegan. Everybody has to eat vegetarian. Everybody has to eat fruititarian. Everybody has, has to eat bugs only. <laughs> I think everybody's really cool with all those diets except for the bug diet. There is no one size fits all. There is no <laughs> universal intergalactic solution that works for everybody. But you know what? We can all do something. We can all do yep, our best. Exactly. We can all try, fail, and adjust. True. And we can all work together. Stop looking for somebody to blame, take mm. personal responsibility, and to do a little something. You know, we, eight years ago, we moved 1,400 miles. We sold everything we had. We've uh, re, um, we purchased and accumulated what we have now over the course of the last eight years. That was dramatic. That was dramatic and traumatic. And it took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears sure. and a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of planning and a lot of work and a lot of sweat. And nobody gave it to us and we didn't ask for any grants. We didn't ask for any help. And we don't want any, we still don't want any. And we're not gonna, we don't want any nope. help. We all have to do something. And exactly. we're not, you know, we're not, we're not sitting here as a Sunday morning quarterback and just saying, those people, them. And you know, a lot of these 
pink haired, you know, uh. woke people. It's always like, but you don't understand, but my, my environment and the global and my, my global warming and all this stuff. And they're either, you know, they're largely unemployed or they're on some type of federal payroll or whatever, being yep. completely inefficient, ineffective and slurping up the tax dollars. And they're like, but, but my plug in car, everybody needs a plug in car, except well, just don't plug it in in the summertime. Hope you don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> and I mean, that's their solutions. Yep. Their solution is everybody, California solution is everybody needs an EV, but don't plug your car in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's So just walk. That's not intelligent, okay? And that's not a solution. How's that a solution? We're going to mandate by, by technocratic uh, mandate, we're going to say that Everybody needs an electrical car. Oh yeah, but don't plug it in. So pretty much stop driving. And uh, by the way, we're going to eliminate all gas, coal, and oil fired plants. So there will be much less electricity. Mm -hmm. And But we do want you to have an electronic vehicle, but don't plug your car in. Hmm. So hopefully you have a very, very strong hamster and a very efficient hamster wheel that's a yeah, so you get the you get the gist, you get the picture. Yeah. We don't have to continue to belabor the topic or the points, but thank you all for watching. Yeah, thank you so um, much. I hope this connects some more dots mm -hmm. and wakes some more people up and get busy, get active, get doing something. Absolutely. And uh, give God all the honor and the glory. He is worthy. We are thankful for what he has blessed us with, and he is faithful. But we, he has given us stewardship over these things and what are we going to do about it true and that's the question that i'm asking you is what are you going to do about it besides blame somebody else or say well they need to do this where is the personal responsibility in that and where is the ownership in that and where's the stewardship in that have a great night y'all all right bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.